You're at Nonviolence Radio, and I'm Stephanie Van Hook. Share the day. So share the day, this is a translation of a greeting from the ocean world of Shora, which was a world created by Joan Slongzewski. She's a science fiction writer and professor at Kenyon College. This is for her 1986 novel, A Door into Ocean. The book describes a society of people who are committed to nonviolence at a very, very deep level, and not just an emotional, sentimental kind of do-no-harm nonviolence, but one that is a really deeply transformed view of what it means to be human, and with that, what's really at stake when we turn to or away from the nonviolent path. I just became so engrossed with this novel because it was more than a book to me. It was the exploration of possibility, what a novel can really do, what nonviolent, not to mention feminist literature, can look like, but also what it means to imagine nonviolent resistance before it happens. So I reached out to Slonkzewski for an interview for Nonviolence Radio, and I'm happy to say that she accepted. Hi, I'm Joan Slonczewski. I teach microbiology at Kenyon College, and I write science fiction books, such as Adore and Ocean, also Brain Plague, about uh, microbes that inhabit people's brains. So I'm interested in lots of different science and science fiction. So I wanted to know if A Door into Ocean was the first science fiction novel that she wrote. Not quite. It was my first novel that gained attention. I had published previously uh, a book about a Quaker meeting on another planet, but A Door into Ocean was the first one that got a lot of attention. Even Isaac Asimov mentioned it as one of the books of the year. And it came out actually right before the peaceful revolutions in Europe. And during the period that I wrote the book, I was told that communist governments never gave up and that we had to use nuclear weapons against them and that this was just a given and nonviolence would never work. And then when these revolutions happened, right around the time that my book came out, people were looking for other ideas in American literature, and my book was one of the few ideas out there that related to what was happening. But I was aware for many years of the resistance in Poland through my father and the Solidarność movement, and also through Quakers. I joined the Society of Friends and read up on uh, Gene Sharp on nonviolent history. Now, I was really curious about this connection to Gene Sharp because Slonczewski's approach also has a deeply spiritual side. So I asked her what really influenced that spiritual side of her nonviolence in her work. My own experience of the Religious Society of Friends provided the spiritual depth of the book because I participated in nonviolent practice through working with the Friends. I was a local organizer for the, the nuclear freeze movement, as well as various, various protests of submarine launchings in Groton, Connecticut. And I witnessed and participated in nonviolent actions that meant a lot to me and really showed me things that could be done. And I was a member of the Religious Society of Friends in New Haven and also in Philadelphia, the Philadelphia meeting. And so I had a lot of experiences there that later filled into the book. For instance, when I was in Philadelphia, there was a Philadelphia Peace Committee of the Society of Friends, and the coordinator of that group conducted the meeting while nursing a child. And this was around 1980, so this was simply not done in society at that time. But I was so impressed that the conductor of a meeting would be nursing a child while she led the meeting that I found this symbolic and significant so this became a plot element in A Door into Ocean, that the, the meetings of the sharers were conducted by a woman nursing a child. 
And I also became very interested from an early age in gender issues and was very interested in the growing gay rights movement. Although I, I always had a feeling that I had a connection that was unclear to that movement. And I've come to realize that I, I really identify with non-binary gender and that I think that was in my writing from the beginning and is also related to nonviolence in a way because I think that non-binary gender is consistent with nonviolence and tends to promote nonviolence. In my lifetime, I've associated strict gender norms with polarization that leads to violence. I think that where people develop and reinforce polar opposites, that this tends to encourage clashes of interests in a way, whereas if you have a, a blending and a range of gender, then there are more possibilities for engagement. Now we're going to hear about these two cultures in the novel that come into conflict. The Valen society, which is more violence-based, and the Sharer society, which is more non-violence-based. I think I also used some of those ideas in the book, because in the book, the Valen culture that was more violent also had polar ideas of gender identity, whereas the Sharers lacked gender identity. And so I connected gender polarities with violence, that gender polarities could be a source of violence especially where you have power differentials. So if you assume that there is always someone in power, then that power has to be reinforced over the other side. And in general, it's males having power over females. And that was what I saw it in, in American culture at the time. I was very concerned with the nuclear arms race, and I saw the nuclear arms race in very gendered terms, that it was about male power figures with male symbolic weapons that were using the necessity so-called for these weapons as, as a way of maintaining power and preventing people from asserting their rights in society. Because if you bomb an entire city, you don't have to worry about what people think anymore because there are no people to think left. In that. That's right. And also because if you convince people that they are in danger, then it, then people are hostages. Okay, people are hostages of the power. So you can say, well, we would love to fund all these social programs, but we don't have the money because we have to spend the money pointing bombs at the other side. We're protecting you. Okay, so it's a protection racket. That was how I saw it. And I was very concerned. Early on in my political understanding, I did not see a way out of the arms race. But as I gained political awareness, I realized that it, this was a fraud, really, and that, in fact, it was uh, unnecessary. And also, this is important, that it was not necessary to become perfect, that one did not have to become perfectly nonviolent, that nonviolence itself, nonviolence or less violence, is an improvement, and that less violence by freezing weapons and by stopping and taking one step at a time, that that is a possible thing. And I think in A Door into Ocean, I showed people who were not perfect. The sharers were not perfect. They were imperfect people who had ways of dealing with each other that we could learn from, even in our society. So next, I try to get Slungsuski to really talk about what the conflict is in the book. Who are the two societies and what's at stake? So you have uh, in a universe uh, far in the future, so there are two planets. Each one considers the other a moon of its own, but they are twin planets. They orbit each other. And so, so the one planet is inhabited by a fairly traditional male-dominated semi-feudal society. There is space travel, but it is discouraged for various political reasons. And there are shuttles, though. There are space shuttles to the other planet, the Shora. So Shora is the planet that is covered entirely by ocean and is inhabited by an all-female population of humans. So I say all-female, and they are physically female, but in terms of gender, I see their gender as indeterminate because they 
view each other as individuals, including individuals with sexual interest. There are sexual interests and sexual jealousies as well. I think that at the time that I wrote, we lacked the words to describe. Today, I would call their society pansexual, so they can be attracted to each other or anything, but on the basis of individuality rather than polar gender. And so uh, they have advanced biological technologies. They have learned to manipulate all the living organisms of their planet, but they have chosen to do so in ways that preserve the natural ecosystem. At the same time, they have powers through their genetic use of living animals and plants. They have powers that can enable them to resist the intrusion by others. So the, the Valence Society attempts to bring trade and control to the sharer society. And then the sharers choose to resist that control. So it's partly a post-colonial narrative, right? A colonial critique. Although in this case, the sharers have, have enough powers of their own that they can resist and they choose to use nonviolent resistance. One thing we learn eventually in the book is that although they choose it, it also becomes clear that they have to because if they don't choose nonviolence, their biological powers would be so great they would eventually overwhelm each other. And that is why they choose it, but it's a survival choice. And I think today we're coming to understand that that choosing nonviolence is a survival choice for our planet as well, the planet Earth, because either we live in harmony with each other and the ecosystem, or we destroy the ecosystem, and then we destroy ourselves. So one thing I really loved about Adorn to Ocean was the, the deep exploration of the question, what does it mean to be a human being? With each society, not quite sure if the other society are indeed human. And so this really comes out of that one interaction at the beginning of the book, when Merwin from the Sharer planet is talking with Spinel from the Valen planet, in a marketplace they see a monkey, and she wants to know, is that being human too? You are human, is that being also human? And Spinel is shocked by the question, no, that's an animal, and even that animal is somebody's food sometimes. So I asked Longsuski about this theme and about that interaction. Well, the idea of the question, um, are you human? What does it mean to be human? So that has many different ways of asking and answers throughout the book. And so in the beginning, it is seen as puzzling as to why, why this is such a big deal and why is she there anyway? And so... In the beginning, there's more a sense that we see from the Valen point of view, which is a little less alien at the beginning. So the Valens, the particularly the, the, the soldiers are looking at these creatures mainly from a legalistic point of view. If they can, they want to prove that the visiting naked women are really just naked animals because then they have fewer rights and it's easier to get rid of them, okay? So their aim is to prove that they are inhuman and lack rights. Whereas the sharer aim, at least Merwin's aim, now remember that the sharers have diverse viewpoints within their society. They're not monolithic. Okay, so, so Merwin is kind of an advanced philosophical thinker, an advanced political thinker. And she is trying to prove that the Valens are human because it's complicated. She, she realizes she has the depth of understanding that they are human, and she's afraid that sharers will make a mistake and label them as non-human and then kill them, and then they won't be able to stop killing. Okay? So we only find that out later in the book. In the beginning, it's just a puzzle, and the, the other sharers don't understand either. They just think, well, Merwin is soft. She just wants to prevent us from protecting Sh Shora from Valadon, and that's all she's trying to do. But they don't understand that she knows that the sharers have the ability to kill themselves. They're a very small group. They're less than a million on their planet, okay, because they have to live on these floating rafts. There isn't that much space for them. So once sharers, if sharers get angry enough to kill the Valens, but despite the fact that they're human, what if they then apply that lesson and kill each other? 
So she feels that for the sake of the sharer future to remain sharers, they have to recognize the humanness of these valens. Okay, so it's ambiguous. Is it that she wonders if they're human, or is she actually she knows they're human, but has to somehow convince the rest of the sharers that they're human? And I think that, that there's some ambiguity there. So part of the question is that the the maleness is a is an issue. So she's already she's already interacted with female Valens, and there's a female Valen character, Berenice, who has earned a, a name in the sharer meeting. She's become partly sharer. Uh, but now the question is, can a male Valen also be shown to be partly sharer? Because if that's true, then the sharers will have to treat the Valens as if they were sharers and and treat them with respect as humans and will not be able to kill them to get rid of them. So, so it's a complex political move. Uh, and then it gets tangled up in her family because a family member becomes personally involved with the boy, Spinell, who comes back with her. So these political aims become tangled up with her family aims in, in that way. And in some parts of the conversation about that, some people say, okay, well, maybe they, like, granted, they could be human, but even if they are human, they're, they've, they're so far gone that they've lost their humanity. And because they've lost their humanity, they, they can only understand violence. And they're so caught up in violence and death hastening that that's what they're trying to do to themselves. They want us to kill them. Yes, so that's, a, that's another argument. So Ginevra and other members of the, the meeting the gathering, it's called, on Shora, they debate these questions. They debate whether, in fact, the Valens are a different kind of creature and whether they have to get rid of them to save Shora. And there, there is debate which is not fully resolved, okay, because some groups leave the gathering and then they go to other gatherings on the planet and come up with slightly different solutions. So part of my reason for showing that was that people find very different solutions. And in fact, nonviolence does mean different things to different people and different individuals and different cultures. And I, I see there something as a, a ladder or a widening of circles of nonviolence. So for instance, Merwin is so extreme in nonviolence that she's also vegetarian. She does not eat food, but her daughter collects seafood to eat. So many sharers consume animals on their planet, whereas Merwin is a more strict nonviolent practitioner. She argues that perhaps not only the Valens are human, but also all the animals of Shura. What if all the animals of Shura are also human? Okay, so she has a more, a more extreme version. So there are different levels of nonviolence that are shown. You referred to the monkey. So on Shura, there are no primates other than humans. So there's a limited subset of animals, and we kind of figure out later why that is, but um, they're all sea creatures and there are no other primates. So it's unusual for sharers to see something that looks close to being human because they see sea animals and then sea creatures and humans, there are obvious differences, but it's a shock to them to see the valens and then a monkey. That's, that's shocking because it looks like a hybrid human animal that they would not ordinarily see. So that's why that's a particular shock to Merwin when Spinell points it out. And then she tries to tell him, well, you know, there are sharers that would like to eat you, right? You know, so this is not a, it's not an idle question if that monkey is human or not. Now, there's one feature on this world of Shora that really stands out from the very beginning. When you're introduced to two main characters, Merwin and Usha, Merwin is known as the impatient one, and Usha is known as the inconsiderate one. These are called self-names, and it turns out on their planet, Shora, you choose a self-name when you join the gathering, which means you are participating in the society more actively and more consciously. You're, you've become an adult. And your self-name is the thing that you're going to work on for the rest of your life. So I asked Longsuski about that, and I also asked her about language as I started the show off, Share the Day. We're introduced to the language of Shora through a kind of translation. And it's a very interesting language because it 
helps to shape their view of a living world. And so I asked if she could say more about it. So the self name is the idea is you take a name based on a fault that you need to overcome. Although sometimes the fault turns out to be a virtue ambiguously. So in Merwin's case, she is uh, impatient, but it turns out that her mission is actually quite urgent and, and has to be done as soon as possible. The other aspect, the language the aspect is very interesting. I haven't heard of other authors. I've been told that there is no other example of this, that I created a language that in which subject and object are interchangeable. And this reflects an absolute understanding that there is no such thing as subject and object, that subject and object are equivalent, that each acts upon the other. And I developed this to quite an extent in the language. It's amazing how far you can get with that. The importance of it is that if you understand subject and object as equivalent, then you understand that ruler and ruled are equivalent and that you cannot subjugate someone, but you also cannot obey someone either because, because it has to be a reciprocal relation. So in effect, the sharer view of equality and, or egalitarianism is embedded in their mind and their language. At this point, we turn into the book and she invites me to read a paragraph that really spoke to me about the language. And this is on page 36 to 37 of the book. The protector uses radios and starships. He jumped up and swung his arm into an arc to mimic the trajectory of a starship. And he rules everyone in Validon. Then everyone rules him. Spinel stopped and stared down at her. What's that? Each force has an equal and opposite force, Merwin said. So who rules without being ruled? His mouth hung open and he pulled at his lip. He knew little of forces except for those that held crystals together as his father had beaten to his head over the years. You have to learn more of our tongue. In sharer speech, my words will explain themselves. Oh, I can talk that stuff. Spinel repeated some of the words he had picked up. Share our words for water and sky, as well as the plant light and the splay-legged click fly that sat on her head and emitted perverse noises. Merwin helped, always patient with his stumbling attempts at pronunciation, but Usha would grimace and shake with soundless laughter. Spinel got more and more annoyed, and when Merwin started on verbs, his temper broke. What the devil is word sharing? Does the word speak mean listen just as well? If I said, listen to me, you might talk instead. What is the use of one without the other? It took me a long time to see this distinction in Valen's speech. Spinel thought over the list of share forms. Learn sharing, work sharing, love sharing. Do you say hit sharing too? If I hit a rock with a chisel, does the rock hit me? I would think so. Don't you feel it in your arm? He frowned and sought a better example. It was so obvious. It was just impossible to explain. I've got it. If Beryl has a child, does a child bear a barrel? That's ridiculous. A mother is born when her child comes. Or if I swim in the sea, does the sea swim in me? Does it not? <laughs> Helplessly, he thought, she can't be that crazy. Please, do you know the difference or don't you? Of course, but what does it matter? Just the idea of being able to create a world with so much intricacy, so much complexity, I wanted to know how Slonsuski did that. I think that's really hard to say. First of all, there's a lot of basic uh, awareness of physics. You know, I was very interested in physics, how the language of physics related to the language of nonviolence that I read in Gandhi and other authors. You know, Gandhi was very much uh, an experimentalist. Uh, he wrote a book titled Experiments with Truth, where he would conduct experiments and say, see, this shows that, in fact, the world is fundamentally nonviolent and that truth is the way. And so I was interested in how far you could go with the language of physics that, in fact, it's true, every force has an opposite, an equal reaction, a force and opposite, an equal reaction. So forces are reciprocal and human relations are reciprocal. Okay, so there is a, a, a victim and a perpetrator, but whoever perpetrates the crime is 
harming himself as creating a criminal and destroying himself as a person. So I think that there is this duality and that that understanding that can be helpful in figuring out how to deal with the world in standing up for yourself, to understand that you're standing up for yourself, but you're also standing up for the other person. Because by preventing yourself being a victim, you're preventing the other from becoming a criminal. So this is, this is important, right? I think at that time also, it was just the beginning of the inclusion movement, which really, really came even decades later. I was fortunate to be associated with the, the Society of Friends, which came to a lot of things sooner than the rest of society. So we were debating gay marriage at that time, and the Quaker meetings in the early 80s accepted same-sex marriage at that time, right? And also became interested in ideas of inherent racism, the idea that we were introduced to inclusion. So it's not just enough to support people of other races, but to recognize the inclusion of each other. And so some of these ideas were just beginning to be debated then, and, and I was able to expand them in a, in a broader framework. I mean, there were many places in the, in the novel where these ideas came out so that when the when the soldiers arrived on Shura and tried to get things to be done their way, um, then of course the, the sharers would interact with them with the idea that well, okay, you need something from us, and and therefore we need something from you, and so they would always seek out reciprocity one way or another, sometimes with disconcerting results. And also it worked out differently. It was very important to me to show diverse outcomes. So when the soldiers came, they saw all the sharers as, uh, I think the term was catfish, was the denigrating word, um, which was a, a denigrating word for female attached to a non-human animal. But they saw them all the same, which is typical that colonizers see the colonized as all the same. But in fact, different raft communities approach the situation in different nonviolent ways. So when the soldiers came with the aim of controlling all the biological factories, so they, they were instructed that the sharers had these biological weapons on their rafts that had to be controlled. So different communities would behave differently. So one community, the soldiers would come and the sharers just wouldn't talk to them. And so the soldiers would look around, they don't see any factories just a bunch of naked women not talking. And then they'd report back, we didn't find anything. And then uh, another raft, so Merwin's raft was a little different. So th they said, well, um, what do you need? And then who's asking? And, and they, they looked at them and they said, well, we see you have all these weapons and this is obviously unhealthy. And your attitude is, is both unhealthy and not grown up. So you must be children and need sick children in need of care. And so we need to share care with you. And so they said, well, what we need is to see your laboratories. So they said, well, we don't normally show our laboratories to children, but um, if this will help you get better, we'll show you what we've got here. And so they showed them one of the laboratories, but the soldiers didn't recognize anything. And then they got hurt on a, on a toxic vine and then that was about it, right? So that was a, a different approach. So then a third nonviolent approach was where the soldiers were a little different. So this, you know, the, the other thing that I try to show is that violent groups are also diverse, right? And are violent in different ways. So there was one platoon of soldiers from Valon that went to a different raft and this was a long subplot, which I actually had to cut. It was much longer in the original of the book. But the platoon leader thought that the mission was a bunch of bunk. And this is often true of lower level officers that they think their superiors don't know anything. Okay, because I did a lot of reading on war literature and the dynamic in warfare. And so I knew this was a dynamic. So this platoon leader is far from the central command. He says, well, 
they don't know anything. There's just a, just a bunch of friendly natives here. So uh, let's try to get on their good side. And so I said, you know, um, we've probably got stuff you like and you might have stuff we like, so let's just get together. And so they tried to be friendly. And so the sharers on that raft also tried to be friendly and said, well, sure, we can, we can have a feast together. Let's do that. And, and uh, you, can, you can see all our places. Of course, you can be sure they hid anything that was really dangerous, right? But they showed them the tunnels in the raft and said, yeah, there's our laboratory. And the platoon leader said, fine, that's the laboratory. We, we report back. Everything's fine and you know, fraternizing with the enemy, right? So that was a different way. So there are different ways of being nonviolent, and there are also different ways of being violent, okay? So that was also important. I guess in, in my experience of reading, I don't read a lot of fiction stories about nonviolent um, because there's so many real life stories out there, but I was so grateful of how complicated and how complex it became and how real to life then it became. and and yet also aspirational in a way that the sharers were responding in diverse ways. And I mean, the violence kept escalating. Just when you were hoping like maybe that this, this would do it and everything's gonna be nice in the end, it wasn't going that way. And it doesn't go that way either. Things are left complex, I think. Now, there's a term in the book that is used to describe Spinell, who is a male-bodied, and he arrives in the world of Shora where there are no other male bodies except for some people from his world. The term they use to describe him is male freak, and I asked Slongzuski if this was considered to be a pejorative term. Well, I think that to be fair, the, sh the sharers who use the term, it's the most appropriate term from their base of normality. What is normal for them is that people, as they understand or as they have experienced people, uh, all have wombs, right? And so if they encounter people that have a different kind of appendage, then they think of that as abnormal, right? And so these are not you know, sophisticated university graduates, right? These are just e everyday people. But I think it's hard to imagine that we take for granted that humans come in two different shapes. But actually, the majority of animals in the animal phylogeny, this is something I know as a biologist, the majority of animals are invertebrates and are hermaphrodites. So hermaphrodite is the standard, if you will. And it's just a very small number of offshoots of the animal phylogeny that have different sexes. So the sharers, they use the term matter-of-factly, that is a person that has an abnormal appendage from their point of view. From our point of view, we see these people, they are human, but they have this abnormal appendage. So therefore, they are freaks. So I, I think that you can say they don't intend male freak as pejorative, we go through this all the time, you know, the question of what is it okay to call people. So I think from, from that standpoint, it certainly would be reasonably taken as a negative by the other side. And, and some sharers did mean it as a negative. Some just, it was a descriptor and others, you know, really detested what they saw as male freaks and wanted to get rid of that kind of entity. I mean, that was part of the debate in sharer society. Meanwhile, Colonel Jader, who they call a normal sister, was the cruelest, most dehumanized human, I think, in the... Yes, yeah, so that was intentional because I was aware of the concern that I did not want this idea that females are always good and males are always bad. So to counteract that conclusion, I did show them the most... The person whose violence is depicted in most detail is that of a female in a Valen society. And that's not at all inconsistent with it being a patriarchal society, because in a patriarchal society, 
when females do gain power, often, but not always, they have to be more violent than the men in order to gain power. That is not always true, but at the time, I, you know, there were key examples such as Prime Minister Thatcher. You know, the comparison between Prime Minister Thatcher, the Iron Lady, and Ronald Reagan was right there, and many people thought that Thatcher, you know, out Reagan, Reagan was even more violent a leader than Reagan was. So I wanted to make it clear that it's clear that that females have the full capacity for violence, that that can't be ignored. That being said, it's also the case that many female leaders offer an extra dimension, a, a new dimension, and bring new kinds of leadership. I mean, those, uh, those things happen also. And so I saw both sides of that. Now, my next question for Slonkowski was, was a big one. It was about God and the practice of religion. And just as these two societies have different approaches to violence and nonviolence, they also had different approaches to God and spirituality. The sharers having a practice called white trance, which she'll describe, and also a, a different relationship to the concept of a living world and God, whereas the Valens had more of a a God in the sky who they're told cares about them, but whom they may or may not have a direct relationship to. I asked her about this. So I think that the idea of white trance was a neurological state that the sharers could could achieve and they could teach other humans to achieve it. And that was a way to give them more power over their own bodies under the pressures, under psychological and physical pressures that they would face. That was there in part for that reason and in part as an extension of spirituality. Uh, so spirituality was very important to me. It was very important uh, as a support for nonviolence, although I do embrace the Gene Sharp point of view that nonviolence can be used as a political tool and does not depend on any particular spirituality. So I embrace that, and I understand Gene Sharp's point of view is that no matter what your aim, if you are nonviolent, it's better than if you are violent. Okay, and I think that's can be debated, but. The, it's an important point. Uh, at the same time, spirituality helps strengthen nonviolence. And I did try to show in the book that the spirituality of the sharers was consistent with Valon spirituality. There, there's a Valon religion presented, the spirit callers, and Spinel actually connects and becomes a spirit caller in, on his own planet and connects that with the sharer spirituality. It just created such a beautiful story, and I'm just so grateful for your work. And your students are so lucky to have you, and I bet you have a lot of beautiful conversations. Well, thank you for this conversation. I'm so glad to see the work that you're doing because we need to promote the, the possibilities. You know, it, our survival today depends on nonviolence, just as the share of survival depended on nonviolence. So the more you can promote this in the world, the better. You're at Nonviolence Radio, and you've been listening to a conversation with Joan Slonczewski, who is a science fiction writer and professor at Kenyon College. And we've been talking about her feminist science fiction book, A Door into Ocean. Nonviolence is happening all over the world, though it's underreported in the mass media. Our next segment is the Nonviolence Report with Michael Nagler. Michael's the president of the Meta Center for Nonviolence and author of The Third Harmony, Nonviolence and the New Story of Human Nature, as well as the Nonviolence Handbook. He'll share news, events, and analyses which might even inspire you to take action where you live. Let's tune in. Greetings, everyone. I'm Michael Nagler, and you are at Nonviolence Radio. And what I'd like to do is to attempt three things in a brief amount of time. I'm going to do some reflections on the recent event, uh, the guilty verdicts, 
that have occurred in the trial of former policeman Derek Chauvin. And then a few select resources and some indigenous movements going on right now. So to begin my reflections, you know, as Plato rightly pointed out, if, if we did not have decay or justice, we could not live together as human beings in a city as opposed to our former animal existence, though now we know that even animals have some sense of justice. However, the photo in the paper of former policeman Chauvin being led off with his hands handcuffed behind his back and his head hung down did not really give me a lot of reassurance. This is Darnell Moore from the project Healing Our City, and it is a prayer to, as he says, integrate soulful prayer into our world. It's a part of a virtual prayer tent for Minneapolis that was held on April 21st. Good morning, good day, wherever you might be around the world. I'm thankful to be invited into this space um, and to gather with you all uh, some thoughts Shifting between joy and lament, relaxed shoulders and raised fists. Now that the judge has read into the public record a three count jury's verdict in the case of Derek Chauvin, what are we to feel? What are we to think? What are we to do? Some of us might feel relieved, eyes flooded and faces as wet as rivers as we reflect on a reality that justice has been more of a poetic aspirational idea rather than a material fact for the most part when it comes to redressing the harm done to black people in the US. Some of us may feel relieved because yesterday's verdict felt like something akin to justice. So we cried, we rejoiced, we may have offered up thanks to God, to spirit, to ancestors. Some of us have depleted our deposit of tears I know that I wasn't sure if I could shed any more, but I did. And I wasn't sure if my face was wet from relief or because as I watched in virtual community with others who breathed a long and collective sigh, or because my sister admitted in our family group chat that she was crying as she watched. And as she watched and cried, I thought about the faith that she must summon every time her 16 year old son Samaj leaves the house fully enraptured in his black youthfulness only to be read as a threat by some, or because the loved ones of George Floyd might finally be able to rest in their grief. Though, how can one rest knowing that a guilty charge will never bring back their beloved? Or hold one another closely because they know how easy it is for someone to snatch away the very body that is in their grasp and heal outside of the purview of a camera or sleep knowing that the person who ended the life of their loved one won't slip out of the grips of accountability like so many other police officers before him. I don't know why I cried while watching an officer of the court cuff a former law enforcement officer who killed a black person, but I know how I felt. I felt like a driver in a vehicle that has been stuck in a traffic jam for so long, whom after having waited with impatient patience, finally begins to move ahead with a deep awareness that further along, you might come upon a traffic jam yet again. I imagine that is how many of us felt. Others felt angry still, and rightfully so, because they might recognize that there exists a form of material justice that we have yet to fully imagine and experience in the US because the practices we employ and tactics we use are the consequence of the limitations of our moral and spiritual imaginations which have been shaped in a country where justice looks like punishment, looks like cages, looks like cuffs, looks like police policing the police after the police kills one of us, looks like more violence as a response to violence. I'm shifting between joy and lament, relaxed shoulders and raised fists because the fact that there are few options outside of other possibilities, the greatest of which would be George Floyd still being alive. The only option then left at our disposal is our, our reliance on a system that itself needs to be raised. These are complicated thoughts and feelings. Imagine if you can a world where a sentence might result in someone like Chauvin having to commit to service over an extended period of time in a very community on the very streets in which he took George Floyd's life. 
Imagine a world where Floyd's family and a community could determine the form of retribution, restitution that Chauvin would be committed to performing, a type of service that demands he bring life to the place where he once brought about a death. Imagine a world where the easy way out ain't a cage, but is replaced with the harder work of deep accountability, self-reckoning, the seeking of forgiveness, the redressing of harmful systems, and reconciliation. What are we to thank and feel and do today, the day after the guilty charge ring out? It is our job to imagine differently, to use that imagination to conjure the type of transformative and just practices that might ultimately result in Black folks' aliveness and the abolition of all that keeps us from having life, whether it be anti-Black racism, prisons, or police. I want a future where justice is not violence refashioned as beauty, as a cage, and a world where Black death is not a requirement for any of it. I want a future where two hours or so after we might shed tears because of the conviction of one officer who killed a Black person, we won't discover that a 16-year-old Black girl is killed and find ourselves impatiently patient in the traffic jam yet again. May it be, may it be for Micaiah Bryant. Thank you. As Darnell Moore said, violence in response to violence. In other words, if this is the best our system can do, then the system itself is at fault, both for bringing about the confrontation that led to George Floyd's death with its undeniable racial element and for coming up with this lame and unhelpful response of continuing violence against violence. So I think those of us who feel relieved are half right. Uh, justice has been done in a situation where justice is rarely delivered. But we should be concerned that this has done nothing to get us off the spiral of violence. The analogy here is the madman with the sword uh, story that uh, Gandhi offers, that uh, he was asked, what, you know, what should you do if someone is coming through the village with a sword, threatening the community? And it may be surprising to us, but he said, the person who dispatches that lunatic will have done himself and the community a favor. However, if you look more closely, he also goes on to say, but we should ask ourselves, what kind of culture have we built such that the people are driven mad and take to violence? So uh, we've been asked whether a restorative justice approach would work in this situation. And I think it's important to realize that there really is no situation in which nonviolence, for example, would not work. I mean, in the case of the madman with the sword, you could, quote, dispatch that person in a state of anger, uh, out of fear, or you could do it in a state of regret and then do the necessary reflection and try to learn from the event, what can we do to make the world a better place? So uh, similarly, restorative justice doesn't really stop at an extreme and extremely violent and hate hateful episode of harm, of a crime. I'm reminded of an essay that came out, oh, back in 1996 by the colleague Ralph Summy called Nonviolence and the Case of the Extremely Ruthless Opponent. So there's no question that we have here an extreme case. And there's no question, again, that we've done the best we could within the system. But it will only be a nonviolent act if we ask ourselves, how would restorative justice apply here? And I'm really impressed by something that Darnell Moore says, that if some restorative justice could have been arrived at, so that the offender ends up with a, say, a long series of social service acts to repay for what he has done, instead of just being a destroyed individual with guilty, 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 ringing out in all the headlines. This is, again, not a question of whether he deserves it or not. It's a question of whether this is helpful or not. Imagine if we had a restorative process 
He ended up doing a, a lot of community work. He might, in Darnell's words, bring life where he has brought death. So now let me share with you a few of the resources that are available. Uh, one group called Hollaback, H-O-L-L-A-B-A-C-K, which we have interviewed here. Uh, they are now offering bystander intervention trainings. And we heard that 40,000 people, or 45,000 people actually, showed up uh, for their trainings, which is a really a new world. It's, uh, it's extremely encouraging. And if you think that's encouraging, you just wait till I get further on in this broadcast. So there's a free concert coming up, which Meta is co-sponsoring. It's with uh, Campaign Nonviolence and Pace Bene, and it's an online music festival, which happens August 21st, and it's called For Goodness Sake, Music for the Nonviolent Future. I remember when I was in Germany some years ago being impressed by the quality of the music that activists and musical people were able to produce there uh, compared to the, you know, not very exciting stuff that was going on here. But this, this is changing. So more from Campaign Nonviolence. I'm quoting from their website here. This month we are bringing you a new event every week to help you dive deeper into the practice of nonviolence. The first that's coming up is a nonviolence online community course, which has uh, already started, and they are happy to report that already there are 700 actions planned for their action week in September. Uh, again, that's an impressive number, but you just hold on. So once a month, Rivera Sun will be holding a skill building webinar and many other resources that they're offering. I'm also happy to say that we have another university project that I didn't know about before, which again connects both academia and the world of activism, as is happening here and there. And this one can be discovered if you look at sustainingpeaceproject.com, and that's coming from Columbia University. So uh, a coming event. On May 15th, we will have the second annual joint memorial by a very important Israeli organization, a Palestinian Israeli, called Combatants for Peace. And the first one, they had a little bit of technical difficulty because here's what I've been leading you up to 200,000 people jammed the discussion. Immediately after that, they'll have a broadcast. And now for just mentioning one indigenous action with the Line 3 and the Dakota Access Pipelines threatening indigenous land, youth from the Standing Rock and Cheyenne River Sioux tribes ran 2,000 miles to deliver a powerful message to the new administration. And I regard this as the perfect way to do symbolism in nonviolence. It was uh, symbolic. They could have just hopped on a plane, but it was also real. It was a concrete thing they had to get from here to there. Also happy to say that there's been a great deal of coalition building up and down the Western indigenous communities around this issue. Also, you might have a look at a group called Defend the Sacred Alliance. That is an international alliance of leaders of indigenous communities along with social movement people and systemic alternative planning. And they recently released a statement about the final injury that's been sustained by the peace community of Colombia, which is collapsed the country of Colombia, called San Jose de Apartado. And here's their statement, or one of them, one of their leaders said one time, the community's power consists of its ability to transform pain into hope. Hope is when we no longer hate the murderer. Hope is when we build collectively, when we make life a reality today where we are. So with those inspiring words, I will leave you for this week and uh, hope to speak to you again soon with more inspiring news from the world of nonviolence. 
Hey everyone, you've been listening to Nonviolence Radio. We want to thank our mother station, KWMR, as well as all of the stations that syndicate the show afterward. Thank you so much. You can find us at wagingnonviolence.org. And if you want to learn more about the Meta Center's work in promoting nonviolence worldwide, visit us at metacenter.org. You can find an archive of all of the shows on Spotify and all the places that you get your podcasts. Till the next time, let's take care of one another. Thank you.